The subject today <clears throat> goes or comes from different angles, perhaps. As I was reading the other day or the other week, all of a sudden this, this subject popped out of there and I thought, oh, that's something that we need to uh, preach on, that we need to hear more from. It might go hand in hand with many things that we preach. It's, it's again today an applicational topic message. And uh, I always like, as you already know, I always like to uh, look at the words that we read in the Bible as if you're reading them for the first time or trying to imagine what was it like back in the days when, when, when this letter, uh, today we're going to go to 1 Peter, part of the time at least, but when 1 Peter was preached for the first time, we don't know what the audience was, but we can imagine that there were people sitting in, uh, in the audience of 1 Peter's letter, and some of them said, oh yeah, that makes sense, I like it, and they went home and they just were fed by that, and while others they, uh, they, as they went home, maybe it was the, the wife turning to her husband and said, do you know what he meant by that? And the husband would have said, yeah, yeah, th this is what it means. And so today we are, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and I'm asking you basically, do you know what it means? Does it apply to you? Can you identify, can you connect with that and say exactly that's what it is? Um, the main verse today are the words that popped out and that we will focus on is, again, you know, simple. So simple that even you guys that not go to school yet, you will understand this. There's, it, even though you cannot even read it, you will understand the words. I don't know if you can apply and connect with them, but you will know exactly what every word means. First Peter 2 verse 7, it goes, uh, it goes, we'll go back, but let's focus on verse 7 to begin with. Unto you. So that is exactly you, okay? That doesn't mean somewhere. No, it's you. Unto you. We've talked about other people. We've talked about issues before, but now it's you. Unto you. It says, which believe he is precious. So now that he is obviously going back to what we had read before, we haven't read it yet, but there's something that it is precious. To you, it is precious. So as the women went home with their husbands that afternoon from this reading, we can imagine that some of the wives would have asked their husbands, or maybe vice versa, the husbands or the, would have asked their wives, or the youth would have asked mom and dad, like, what is this thing that is supposed to be so precious about? Is it precious to you? He said it was precious to you. Do you know what he's talking about? If we would dismiss today and I would say, okay, now you all go home and you tell your children that part which is very precious to you or your brother or your sister, will you know anything? What is precious to you and me? What I said is it is so simple to understand. You therefore which believe he is precious. That word precious, I think, is easy to understand. Sometimes people would ask, each other, is this precious? And mom would say, yeah, it is precious. It's valuable. We like it. I heard uh, <clears throat> Brother Norman shared something about someone in Belize. And uh, <clears throat> not that I know that story, but, you know, there's something about that. There's obviously a sad part in the situation. So what happens is if something is very precious to you, but the very same thing is not precious to me, it will start to pull us apart. I have watched this, and uh, I guess maybe it's because my age is where it is. Uh, I started to see some of these things a little differently than I did 25 years ago, but what I, what I, I saw then too, but today I see it from a little bit more, more meaning maybe perhaps, but you have three little boys. Some of you have three children at home and they all play. They all play on the same. They're all building the same project, whatever that is. And uh, they're all working on it and they're working on it and, and it might not all work, but, but they keep making it working and they keep going at it until someone 
of the three loses its preciousness of the, sub, of the project. And what happens? Most of the time, you have three children. Sometimes it's more, but they all play the same game, and it just is such a harmonious game. Everybody likes to play it until one or two lose the preciousness of it. And you know what? It doesn't take very long. The whole game is a ruin. Same thing with so many things. It's he is precious to you. If we are all sitting here today and Christ is precious to every one of us, you know what? <clears throat> There's one guarantee. Every church where Christ continues to stay precious, and I mean precious, we will continue to harmonize. But if that goes away, we can set up every rule you want. We will never harmonize. Not to the depth where we can survive. Let's go back to verse 4 of 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of man, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. That word means confused. Verse 7, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. I already read that. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone, that's, this is now verse 8, applies to the disobedient, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, where unto also they were appointed. Now, we're not going to dig, dig much into uh, many of the details here. <clears throat> but the thing that is so precious to us, I think by now we have an understanding. That is the stone, which is Jesus. That's the cornerstone. That's the main stone. That's the main block in the building. That is where everything else depends on. And so that is very, very precious. It is very, it is, it's dear to my heart and it's my prayer for my own life and it's my prayer for all of us that are here today and all of you that are at home listening, but that we would all come to that point that Jesus Christ, he is precious, the main, the main block of my life. He is precious. It says he was disallowed. That's what uh, I think it was David in Psalm 118. It was a rejected stone, disallowed of men. But this Jesus, this stone is chosen of God and it is precious in the sight of God. Now, we want to, like I said, we want to see if we can apply or what we can apply. There is lots for us to apply out of this message. And so I have it in three points today. Point number one that we want to dig into is, can you identify with the awareness or with the feeling that the stone or that Jesus is very precious? Does that connect with you? <clears throat> Point number two is, how can this stone, which is Jesus, become precious to me? And then the last point, <clears throat> the effects of this stone being precious to us. You and I cannot sit here today and say, oh yeah, he's precious. Wow, he's just so precious, the stone. And not somewhere, somehow show it in life. It's, we could just basically say, oh, well, he must not be very precious to you. Uh, he must be very precious to you. I can see that in your life. You know, if we would examine ourselves that way, I wonder what would we write of each other. It would be good for, for us to ask others, do you think that Jesus is precious to me? Like, no respect a person. Just tell me, does it seem to you that Jesus is precious to me? 
what would people say about your life? Would they right away say, oh yeah, that's very evident. And then you would ask, well, how do you know that he is precious to me? And then they would start to come up with a lot of stuff. I see this in you. I see this in you. I know you're doing this. I know you're thinking. I know you're believing. I know your practices like through the day and through the week. It just tells me over and over and over that you must have something very precious, and that is Christ. How many of us would stand there when our friends would come and they would ask us and we would look along them and we would think along their lives and, and uh, we would sort of wish they had never asked us because we would have to be too, confronted, too confrontational and say, well, honestly, I don't know if I see anything in your life. Or worse yet, if they would look at us and say, don't know, I've never noticed, never, never, yeah, I work with you side by side. We're on the same welding bench or same office but I, no, I don't find that you have anything precious as far as Jesus is concerned. What about if children would ask mom and dad, mom or dad, is this what the preacher talked about in church? Is that precious to you? Like, can you explain? And mom would say, yeah, well, maybe, I don't know. I never thought of it. I hope we would all say, oh yeah, he's precious. I wake up with that every morning and I go through my day. Not that I think of him 24 hours a day, but you know, he's always there. Can you identify with the awareness of this stone being precious? That's the question. I wish that every one of us could say, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. He is so precious. <clears throat> question is, how precious is Jesus to you? Let's ask ourselves a few questions. How precious is he? If he's precious to us, then we will constantly think of him. It doesn't mean that we think of him all the time. No, nope, you're busy at work, you're doing your work, you're doing a good job, you're studying, whatever you do. It's, it's not that you're constantly just thinking of Jesus Christ. But it's not that we go through the days and never thought of, oh, there's that precious Jesus, he's my, he's my savior. We constantly think of him. In fact, if he is precious to us, we constantly try to think more and more of him. We make effort in remembering him. We desire to get to know him better. We love his word. Yeah, we don't understand much of it. It's hard for us to understand, just like it was in the days of Peter. But I wish I knew more. I wish I knew more of him. I like to read about it. I like to hear when somebody explains his word. I like to listen to somebody preaching. Whatever it is, but I just like that. Love that word. There's people today, they're so confused. And they, it says they will not be confounded if this stone is precious. I think I've shared many of these stories before, but there's Christians today, they struggle in their life, and I, I can tell you why. And that is, yeah, Jesus is precious to me, but if I have a choice of two, as I spend my trip, as I spend my time on the field, as I, as I have a choice to listen or watch stuff, if I have a choice of two, I always choose the straw part, the shallow stuff. Like not the bad, wicked singing or movies or, or whatever, entertainment. I don't, no, no, we don't choose that wicked stuff. But if I have a choice between something that's going to teach me about Christ or something that's going to entertain me in a hopefully non-harmful way, many of God's people choose the non-harmful entertainment. And then turn around and say, he is precious. And the children look and wonder, like, what does the word precious mean to mom and dad? Or mom and dad turn around and they think about their youth. And they think, I wonder what is precious, truly what is precious to my 20-year-old or my young folks? Are we, does that make sense that people would ask the question, what is precious to you? Is it precious? Or, or am I just trying to, to uh, <clears throat> falsely comfort myself in this? You know, if he is precious to me, there is a constant feeling of appreciation towards him. It is precious. Every reminder of Jesus leaves a thrill or good feeling. And I mean what I just said. It leaves a thrill or good feeling every time we think of Jesus. 
But if I lack this awareness of him being precious, there's a chance for that. And as I stand before you this morning, I, I, can, I could believe that there's some of you, in all honesty, in all goodness of your heart, you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, I'm not sure that he's really precious to me. I wish he was precious to me, but I honestly, I'm lacking. I can hear already I'm lacking in this. And maybe as you sit there, you will, you're, the tendency is to just get discouraged. Don't. Don't do that. <clears throat> How do you respond to if you find in yourself that I don't really feel that he's so, so precious? I truly wish to be obedient. I truly want to be what Christ wants me to be. But this thrilling and loving relationship with God, I seem to miss in my life. How do you respond to those feelings? What's the solution to that? Here's a few suggestions. Some of us, some churches have come together and have put in a lot of effort <clears throat> to, uh, to simplify all of this. And that is, we could decide, we could discuss and say, okay, as churches, as God's living people, let's make sure we, we all fall <clears throat> and, and follow a set of guidelines and rules. And then we would try to control everything in that. And we would come up with a good plan. <clears throat> in fact, that's what they did in the first generation church. They did that. And some of us would like to go back to that and say that, was, that worked for them. Why shouldn't it work for us? That way, we wouldn't need to study God's Word so much. We wouldn't need to know so much of God's Word. We could just have a guideline, and we would all follow along that guideline. Now, please don't get me as that all guidelines are bad. But some, if, if a guideline or a, uh, uh, <clears throat> articles of faith or all these other wonderful things that we have, and, and there's, there's a good place for them, but they are meant to be used as crutches to get you from point A to point B in a quicker way. But once you mature in Christ, you want to know his word way beyond any guideline, way beyond any uh, articles of faith could ever take it. So that, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. We want to know his word. We want to know the entire word. The other way, the other solution to trying to find him to become precious is <clears throat> are you finding that Jesus, this stone of preciousness, restricts your life? And you find it almost boring to meditate on him or on his word? <clears throat> Would you, if you were all honest today, would you say, if only I could allow my choices and my desires to dominate, then I could also live a happy life. Would you, if you were all honest this morning, would you have to say, yeah, it's conflicting. I'm a Christian, but I find God's word to so often conflict with what I'd like to do. And therefore, you might sit here today and you might say, how can I come to a point where that very thing becomes precious? Precious. You know, that is a reality in a lot of people's life. There's a reality in a lot of Christians' life. They find that which is precious in God's word to be rather restrictive. <clears throat> And then there's the third group here that we might have here, and that is that you would say, yeah, I know, I've read it too, but I simply almost never think of him. Just as if it's not part of my mind. The everyday work schedule, the daily demands, they just fill my mind to where there is no room to think of him. I don't live a bad life. I don't live a sinful life. But yeah, I don't really think of this precious stone. He's just not enough part of my life. You know, all of that, maybe we could add more, but we deal with these things. Let's not be okay if that is where we are. There is a way out. That brings us to point number two. How can this stone become precious to me if that is not really what it is? How can it become precious? Number one, let's look into our lives 
if you find that this stone is not really precious to you, then identify what's the reason, what's keeping you and me from finding him to be precious. Is there something going on? Do you feel today, or have you battled in the past, that about God's word, that God's word is teaching you something, God's word is convicting you about something that you have a hard time to surrender to? Maybe you're just keeping it for yourself. Maybe you're tr praying about it. Maybe you're wishing for a way around it. But you're just not willing to surrender. Constantly searching for a way out. Then you need to surrender. We will never find this to be precious before we surrender. Or is there an issue in your life that you're unwilling to accept the way it is. It is this way, but you're fighting constantly with it. There's a, there's a, there's a, there might be an issue in your life that you wish would change. But you're not willing to choose and to accept the way it is. And therefore, you're holding God responsible. You're fighting with God. Unwilling to accept. Or maybe there's another issue in your life that you have been convicted about that you should humble yourself and just, you know, let go. Let go of it and just be different. But you're, will, you're unwilling to humble. Are you holding something in bitterness and you cannot forgive? You keep somebody responsible for your problems. Are you dealing with anger? Maybe you're angry with God. Are you and I dealing with envy? Are we dealing with hidden sin, hypocrisy? You know, as long as we're holding on to any of these things, we will never find Jesus to be precious. It's a stumbling. It's a stumbling. But when we can finally surrender and let go, humble ourselves to his will, all of a sudden he becomes precious. Ephesians 4.15 encouraged the people to grow in him. See, it was dealing with the people that were tossed to and fro. One wind came, they moved over to this side. Another teaching came and they moved over to the other side. They never really got a hold, as it seems, to who Jesus was. And so they were encouraged to grow in him. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. So if you're here today this morning and you say, yeah, well, I've been a Christian for so many years and, you know, it hits me smack in the face again. This message, yes, I don't find him precious. I find him just a little bit precious, but there's other things that I find even more precious. Don't allow that to discourage you. Don't fall back and say, yeah, well, that's just who I am. I'll just be always like that. In fact, my mom was like that or my dad was like that. No, 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 no. Grow up into him. That's what was said to the Ephesians. You are not in a hopeless case, but we might need to make action. These people, they were used, they were used to be like children that were tossed to and fro. Couldn't quite stand the test. <clears throat> it reminded me of the uh, parable of the sower in Matthew 13. As he uh, uh, <clears throat> spread the seed on the ground, there were these that had good ground. You know, uh, good, um, they, they, they were ready for the word of God. And it says, uh, Matthew 13, 23, But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some hundred and some sixty and some thirty. These people, they were there. They were hearing the word and they took it with them, and they understood it. They applied it. They lived it. You and I sit here today, and there's none of us that can say, oh, I wish I was like I should be, and then we hear something, and, and, it, and it tells us, you have to change. 
right at that moment, we are all aware whether we are willing to change or whether we right away find a way to somehow, no, it doesn't apply to me. It does not apply to me. I know we sometimes are in situations that we don't know, God, what is your will? Like, I, I feel a burden. I'm not sure what it is. But you know what? We are all aware of our attitude. What's the attitude? We got to have a Christ-like attitude. <clears throat> These people, they understand. We that understand, we that want to understand, we meditate and we ask God and he leads us. Another point that we have to understand in order that Jesus becomes precious to us is we have to understand who would I be without Jesus? Paul calls in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19, he says we would be most miserable if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. A while ago, some good time ago, I had a conversation with a young man and um, he shared his life. I've sat with him a number of times and he shared his life and I found out that he was to the point of, you know, just giving up. I don't know that he was necessarily suicidal, but, you know, right next to that. And as I looked at his situation, I saw, I saw, yeah, that's true. He had lost his wife. He had lost all of his belongings, and he was a poor man. And uh, many of those background problems, just, just nothing behind him that looked attractive, and, of course, nothing ahead of him in his own eyes that looked anywhere attractive. And as I sat there, I have often prayed, Lord, teach me, show me what, you know, just show me, God, help me to understand this man. And one day as we sat together, I could identify with him in a new way. And that was this. I had a good upbringing, which was nothing, had nothing to do with me. I feel good because my good upbringing, and most of you do too. I'm fine because my parents, they loved me and gave me a good upbringing. I knew that I had an acceptable reputation in my circle of people. I live in a good relationship with my family and friends and my wife. I am financially in a good shape. And you know, on and on the list would go. As I sat with him, I saw all of these things were missing in his life. And all of those things were relatively out of his control. And all of those things were relatively out of my control as well. And then as I sat there one day, I said, you know what? I can see something, and that is that you and I were exactly the same. And he looked at me and he said, like, what? How, how can you say something like that? I said, the only difference that I and you have between us is, and I didn't say this to brag about me, but I said, there's something that's very precious to me that is not precious to you. And he wanted to hear what that is. And I said, all these things that my parents have given me, I could lose a lot of that too. Not like totally, but I could lose that too. And I told this friend that day, I said, there's one thing in your life, and if you cannot come to that point, you will likely never get out of your, your pit. And that is, if Jesus will not become precious to you, you will die in your situation." I was thinking about myself. You know, God has so far given grace, but what would I have if nobody would appreciate you anymore? Everywhere you would turn, you would get the feeling that you're just a, a nuisance and a burden. What would hold on, where would you and I hold on to if we knew that financially we were totally kaput? Would you still have something to hold on to? Or would you and I then also go and sit on the block of wood and say, there's no reason to continue to live. Only if Christ is precious. <clears throat> we have an eternal, solid ground on which we can continue on. Now the other part to meditate on in order to make him more precious. Let me uh, share this, and I know I've said this before. Now that was the other side. Who am I in Christ? You know what? If we don't understand who we are in Christ, he will never be very precious to us. In spite of all of our problems and weaknesses and sins and whatever we deal with, 
We have to constantly remind us who I am in Christ. And I know you know this stuff. I'm going to repeat some of that. How often do you meditate on who you are in Christ? Let's say you have days where things are going tough. Let's say you have days where you... You know, things are going against you, whether that's your family, whether that's your finances, or whether that's your own health, or whatever that is, it's going against you, it's, it's threatening you. What do you meditate about yourself at that time? Where do you draw courage? Are we just hoping that tomorrow is going to be another day? There's this statement that says, well, one day at a time. Good thing. That's a good statement. Why not a week at a time? Why not the rest of your life? There's something in your life that's not going to change regardless how long you live, and that's the grace of God. This preciousness of Jesus Christ, I'm not taking away about this one day at a time. It, it applies to certain places. But as Christians, we can look way beyond that, and we can say, by the grace of God, I will survive, and regardless if I live another 100 years, I'll be a winner. I'll be coming through. That is what I am in Christ. It is true. It is true. That is who you are. It doesn't matter what you're facing with. But that is the preciousness of that cornerstone. Do you ever worship? Do you constantly worship him because of what you are in him? Do you remind your own mind about who you are in him? Do you remind yourself over and over that I am a child of God? I mean, it's relatively easy to do when life is going good and things are going in your favor. But what about the days when things are disappointing, when things just don't seem to be all that bright? Can we still draw and meditate and say, He's precious. He is precious to me because I am His child. He has made me holy. I, I had a good conversation this week with a young uh, person and I, you know, it just struck me again. How often do you think about it? That you're made holy. Like holy. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says we are as righteous as God. In fact, we have become the righteousness of God. You know, some of these things, they're just blows our mind away. We have no way to understand. Like me being as righteous as God. Meaning that the day that I stand before judgment and God will, we will see God face to face. And we know we have eternity ahead of us. We will find out I am as righteous as God. I'm waiting for that day. I think you too. I know that our minds today, they can, there's no way that we can grasp that. There's no way how we can figure that out. But that day, we will be like him. It says, we're getting there just a little bit here. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, you have been made rich. And on and on. Meditate. Who are you in Christ? You know, if we don't want to meditate in that, we will lo likely lose the preciousness of him. Now to our last point. The effects or the results of the stone becoming or being precious to us. We read there before in 1 Peter that we become lively stones. I like that. In fact, I was thinking that would make a very good message. This, this, this scripture portion, we could read that as a church life. And it is being used as that. But number one is when he becomes precious, we become alive. That is the beautiful thing about Christians coming together. My, my desire for my own life, for all of us, is that that's what would draw us together. He's precious. And then we as a church. You know, I don't know what we as a church face in the future, but there's one thing for certain, and please, let's all be aware of this. I don't say this to scare us, but IMF Church, and then all of you who are visiting here with us today, wherever home is for you, but you are living in a life where your church is going to go through difficult times, where Satan will be right within your brotherhood, and he will try to, to rip apart what is looking good. Satan will never rip that apart unless we lose the preciousness of this cornerstone. If there's a brotherhood that focuses on keeping Jesus precious, we will win the battle. <clears throat> Through my life, people have often asked me, hey, Ronald, how do you do that in your church that you can keep what you have? Well, you know, that's a long subject. I have often said, and I think I've said this at home, that we have chosen the most complicated way to do church life. 
And they ask, what does that mean? I say, we have no guidelines. We try to live according to God's word. Of course, we're having values and we're trying to keep them, but we don't want to live on them. We want to live on the word of Jesus. That's the subject on its own. <clears throat> we will experience this inner power as he becomes precious. You and my power is often based only on how precious the stone is. If you and I lack power, there's a good chance that the stone hasn't be, has, has lost its, its value. We are perhaps getting more interested in other th things that never charge us spiritually. <clears throat> as this is a precious stone to us, we will become a part of, of a spiritual circle. I sense that I am alone. I don't want to be just always alone. I want to be in the presence of others that find this stone to be precious as well. People have sometimes said, you know what, it's precious. I can live by it by myself. And I say, well, you know, not that I'm here to judge anybody, but if you're good to be just by yourself, it's just like the children who really love that game. They soon ask, will somebody come and play with me? Because it's fun. The game is fun. Christianity, it's precious. Will you come and join with me? Let's, let's join together. I know we're not all equally personally... Um, People, people's persons, but we find this thing to be precious. It draws us together. We bear much fruit together. It generates a love towards Jesus and his word. That is another evidence of, being, of finding this stone to be precious. Our lives are driven by this. Our lives, they generate. We want to be there. He is precious. It is today a shadow we see of something that is coming. And today's life is a shadow of what is to come. <clears throat> Years ago, I had a conversation, or I overheard this conversation more so than it was with me. <clears throat> Somebody said, he didn't see much of heaven to be very enjoyable. And I thought, oh, what's that? That sounds no good. He said, well, if he thought of all the, the fruits that he were bearing, the trees that were bearing fruit 12 times a year, the golden streets, he found that to be very enthusiastic. Uh, he was very enthused about that. But to be in the presence of Jesus and worshiping him forever and ever, he missed that. He, he didn't know. You know, like sometimes you, uh, you hear something and then you put that in the back of your mind and then you just watch something for a while. And that's what I did with this. And it took so and so long, I found out this individual was really struggling in his spiritual life. I was thinking later, I should have so told him that day, I said, you know what, brother, either this becomes precious to you or you're going to hit a ditch. If Jesus is not precious to us, we will hit the ditch. Yeah, we will. <clears throat> <clears throat> What lies before us? In 1 Peter 5 verse 4, he says, he will give us the crown of his, uh, in, on the, after the judgment. Or love, this is my own words, but the day that we will stand before Jesus and we will, we will receive the crown, which we will in return give back or offer back, this day we will be finally and once and for all overpowered by this preciousness that we have already gotten a little sense of. He's precious today, but that day all of, all of the blur will be gone and we will look him straight in the face and we will find he is very, very precious. First Peter 2, 2, 1 John 2.28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I was thinking about that. How many of God's people, if Jesus would bang, he would be here today, would be kind of shy? Oh, that's Jesus. Oh, that's who he really is. And we would be ashamed. I can identify with that. I have times that I would be ashamed. I have, I have attitudes that I know I would be very embarrassed if Jesus would be in that attitude all of a sudden. I'm not going to dig into that verse, but it sounds like there's a chance that some people would be ashamed when Jesus comes. But then there's 1 John 3 verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. He's precious. We are sons and he is precious. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. I like that. That's 1 John. He always says, we know that 
Listen to this. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Meaning that all blur is gone. And here's Christ, and he is there. I knew him. I knew him partially because of my bad sight. I didn't quite understand it. But here we are, face to face. And here he is. And our, our entire life will just flow into him. And we will worship him. At this moment, we will see him. Our eyes in full understanding see the preciousness of Jesus. <clears throat> you know what? That's the moment that I believe that we as God's people, we, lay, we will lay down our crown before him because he will become so overwhelmingly, eternally precious to us. This is also the moment. Now this is a Ronald Cornelson thought. I'll give it to you to take home and think about it. But this is also the moment where you and I will not worry at any form who else is in heaven. We will lay our crown and we will see the master and it's all that matters at that moment. We will finally find his precious, you know, absolutely clear and no misunderstanding. And we will not worry who made it to heaven and who didn't. I know many of us, you know, yesterday was six years ago that my mom passed away. It's a little bit of a reminder. Oh, it would be good to spend time with her. Some of you are waiting to see your wife or your, your child or your spouse and we're looking forward to see him. That's all good. And we likely will. I expect we will. But when this preciousness of Jesus will finally be crystal clear, it's just like on your wedding. The day that you got married, I wonder, do you remember which of your friends were at your wedding? Some of us might. But what we all knew is the day that we got married, if the bridegroom had been missing, no friend would have replaced that. We could have forgotten if one of our good friends wasn't there for whatever reason. But the bridegroom or the bride took everything else and that was all that mattered. In fact, we would have said, if only the two of us had been there, it would have still been complete. And it is complete. We're married. And that's the moment when finally we stand before Jesus and the preciousness just overflows. Question before we go home. Are you convinced that Jesus is precious to you? Or are you still pursuing something just a little bit besides that? Hoping to find something that's going to fill your soul. It says, unto you he is precious. Can we stand and let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we bow before you. God, we would like at this moment to just stand before you on the eternal gates of glory. Lord, we desire to already have the crown and lay it down before you because we have no right for a crown of righteousness. But God, we know, Jesus, we know, you are that precious cornerstone upon which we live, upon which we are filled. Lord, we yearn to come into your presence where all of a sudden, all the blur will be gone and we will stand face to face and we will be able to see the preciousness. But Father, in the meantime, as we linger on with life, as there are so many things in this life that Satan is trying to throw into our ways to steer our minds, to steer our eyes onto something else, God, I pray, revive my own life. Revive every one of us. Give us eyes up so that we would see the preciousness of Jesus. And God, that those of us who are seeking for other things to fill our hearts and to fill our minds, oh God, I pray that every one of us would have the grace to drop them all, to surrender, to humble ourselves to where you will become precious. I pray that you would inspire and keep us all, those who are strong in you, that we would with more courage and with more fervency build in this kingdom while we still have days. In Jesus' name, amen.